Okay, millions of YouTube subscribers, welcome back to the man cave. The salubrious surrounds thereof. Actually, we're in a kind of an adjunct. It's quite labyrinthine around here. And this is the jam room. Also for my famous band, Gerald Keeney and the Gerald Keeneys. Check them out. Tonight, a bit more down tempo. We're going to be doing another fireside vlog in the Queenslander, but we try not to have fires in the wooden houses. And this one's, it's, it's about my father. It's a homage to my father, James Keeney. He was 73 when he died in 2005. Dad's postgraduate calling as a medical practitioner was as an anaesthetist. Anesthesiologist, if you like polysyllables. Now, Dad decided well, the family, mum and dad, the couple, decided to go to to England, to London, in order to enter the Royal College of Surgeons. Actually, they studied for a time in Edinburgh, but anyway. And uh, unfortunately, mum, well, well, fortunately for me and my sister, Kath, mum became a full-time mother and she didn't enter the, the, didn't try to enter the Royal College of Surgeons, but dad did as a anesthesiologist no less and one reason why he did was because he was very interested in taking anesthesiology and the, the practice of being an anaesthetist further and here's the tie for the Royal College of Surgeons it's sans, you won't be able to see it but the, the crest is sans the supporters and the motto and the thing up the top which I've forgotten what's called but it's the same charges and I wear this with pride I, I, I don't wear it in contexts where I'm pretending to be from the Royal College of Surgeons when I'm not but I wear it with pride because I believe the Royal College of Surgeons was was by the standards of, of today not not a corrupt institution but one which actually had a certain degree of integrity based upon their belief in the uh, excellence of their trade now, Dad wanted to take that trade. Oh, oops, let's just destroy the heritage family tie here. Uh, Dad wanted to. Uh, Dad wanted to take that trade further, and there's a, at the time, and I still think it's the case that there's a couple of ways you can go if you want to, if you want to explore the different avenues that are involved in being an anaesthetist. So, an anaesthetist uses basically Boyle's law to, to monitor to to understand and to control the blood gases in a patient and that's the way that an anaesthetist performs that familiar function of keeping you under so you don't wake up halfway through an operation and see someone drinking whiskey and whipping it, ripping out your guts now Boyle's law is p1 over v1 equals p2 over v, v2 very basically so it's it's a it's a loyal about it's a uh, it's a law about a bit more drink it's a law about blood gases and the same law has a fundamental application in intensivism. So dad was attracted to intensivism. And there's sort of two main areas of intensivism. There's intensive care, which is basically splits again into a couple of areas, saving people from dying and giving people a good death. And then you go to neonatology, which is when babies are born too early and they have to be, they have to be intubated. So intensive care patients and neonates all have to be monitored and there has to be intervention such that their blood gases are right if they are to survive or if they are to die nicely. And so this homage to my father is actually about a duality there which is that my father became very interested both in giving people the chance at life who otherwise wouldn't have had it premature babies who were born very early and in giving people a good death and he wound up having a job on the Acton Peninsula which was a which is a peninsula in a design, one of the few designed cities in the world in Canberra. And there was a hospital on it called Royal Canberra Hospital, which has since been demolished. So 
dad wound up in this design city very interested in life and death and not just life and death but good a good death and the possibility of life and to me I guess my experience of that time and place made me quite utopian and I don't mean utopian as in no place utopia but more like what the Australian philosophers Richard uh, Sylvan and, and Val Plum would talk about utopia, e-utopia, happiness, a happy place. Happiness being in some ways achievable more than ever by, by the proper exercise of knowledge. So the utopia was a utopia in which a good death was possible and in which it was possible to come into the world with bodily integrity. And in that sense, it was, it was sort of sealed at both ends, a bit like they say that on one theory, uh, there's no, a no boundary condition of the cosmos, that the, the cosmos is sealed by the Big Bang at one end and then there's all these possibilities. And then the other end is sealed by, well, who knows what, but maybe something else. And instead of this sort of cosmic hole, which I'm using as an analogy, there was a, there's a social, a social hole which includes the beginning and the end. And the good life is part of the good birth and the good death. And at the time, and I've written about this elsewhere, so I'll put a link underneath, that, that peninsula and that city certainly had, for various reasons, which are discussed if you follow the link, a advantageous position in respect of, of this good life. So, the, the, for instance, the university, which was right next to that peninsula and partly on that peninsula, was also a, a, a place which, which managed to have a certain degree of intellectual independence for a time which some of us later tried to defend and, and we failed, we failed in that defence. The city itself is, as I mentioned, one of the few design cities in the world and it's modelled on utopian visions, if somewhat mystical ones based on immorality and so on, but certainly utopian yearnings, which Walter and Marion Burley Griffin, the, t the two designers of Canberra, drew from a wide variety of, of cultural sources, from everything from uh, South American cities through to uh, the design of Asian cities and, and, and many, other, many other influences as well. I'm not saying it worked completely, but certainly I would say that when I grew up on that peninsula with Dad working as a intensivist and giving people good deaths and giving people good lives, I, I certainly lived in an environment which was utopian, pre-utopian, anticipating of utopia, in a sense. Now I don't, I don't claim I've got my my father's gifts or. The brilliance of his 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 vision and the, the commitment that he gave to people and the the concrete difference he made to people's lives and deaths i can't, I can't claim that as i've said i i think that in many ways i failed in the struggle i was engaged in but it whatever i'm not here to uh, to feel self-pity so i do i guess live in my father's shadow but my father's shadow is not simply about where his oldest son was, was cast, not cast. My father's shadow was also about the fact that as utopian as he was, there were certain limits to my father's thinking. And he believed that a market system which involves 
abstract accumulation, abstract quantitative accumulation, was the only way human beings could live. Now, obviously, this video is not going to go too much into the critique of capitalist society, but certainly it was the case that that society didn't serve him or, 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 or didn't perhaps live up to the optimistic visions that he had as late as the early 90s living on that peninsula. And he'd actually had a hand in designing the, the ward, the, the, both the neonate ward, and uh, especially the neonate ward, but he, he, he designed them in so far as not, not just internally designing the wards, but also in, in how the wards linked to other areas of the hospital, including, including intensive care proper. And all of that was, was scotched. Funding was cut and the health system was reorganised, downsized and privatised to some extent, and goodbye. So what he believed would serve him perhaps, well certainly didn't, and I know he probably would have seen it differently, he might have seen it in terms of human evil or I don't know. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the shadow that he cast was not just a shadow in which one feels that the sun has been blotted by one's ancestor, but a shadow in which there was a, a lack of knowledge and at some point a beautiful project came to an end. So why am I making this video? Well. As much as the beautiful project came to an end, perhaps it only came to an end temporarily. <laughs>